Good evening, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Kelly. I'm the director of Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. And on behalf of Dublin City Council's libraries, I would like to welcome you all to our celebratory evening here in this wonderful city gallery for this year's One Dublin, One Book, The Coroner's Daughter by Andrew Hughes. And I'd like to extend a special warm welcome to our first citizen of Dublin, the Lord Mayor, Caroline Conroy, and of course, to a very busy lady, the Minister for Tourism, Culture, Arts, Grail Talk, Sports and Media, Catherine Martin, and her team from the department, and indeed, Dublin City Librarian, Murray Domes. And while the One Dublin, One Book initiative is coordinated by Dublin City Council annually, we are grateful for the support received from the Minister's Department, which has allowed the programme grow from strength to strength over the years. So we'll hear shortly from the Lord Mayor and Minister on this before our evening gets underway. And what an evening is in store for us, not least with Andrew in the centre, but with music from the 19th century to serenade us from the Dublin String Quartet and performances from actors Julie Crowe and Shane O'Regan. An evening about books is definitely not complete without Niall McManigal. Niall's panache and interview skills always make our library events special. So now I call upon our Lord Mayor to say a few words, followed by Minister Martin. Thank you. I have to pull it down. <laughs> Good evening. All. And may I have, uh, say a special welcome to my party colleague, Minister Catherine Martin. It is lovely for us to be here to share in the celebration of this year's One Dublin, One Book author, Andrew Hughes, and his popular book, The Coroner's Daughter. Being Lord Mayor and a councillor, I am fortunate to see on a daily basis the work achieved by the City Council, including the delivery of library service our living rooms in the city who champion reading all through the initiatives such as One Dublin, One Book. Two months ago, I had the privilege of launching this programme and I am delighted to see such a successful campaign in full swing with street banners, and digital signs, social media, radio announcements, encouraging us to get reading this year's One Dublin, One Book. All residents and visitors, regardless of social or cultural background, should feel a sense of ownership and engagement with the city. Campaigns such as One Dublin, One Book energise us, promoting well-being and quality of life, which is, of course, the mission of Dublin City Council. There are plenty of reasons for us to read. Did you know that when you're lost in a good book, your body begins to relax and your breathing slows down, leading to a decrease in heart rate and blood pressure? We all need that. There are other benefits too, not least reducing stress, improving vocabulary, comprehension in younger readers and helping adolescents in their self-identity. Our heroine in this year's book is a young woman with a curious mind itching to put, to put it to use. A role model in the centre of this story encourages young women to challenge themselves and pursue careers in the sciences. And I am mindful of President Biden's uh, affirmation last week of Ireland's own first citizen scientist, astronaut candidate, candidate uh, Nora Patton. Authors like Andrew Hughes give us reading public such a pleasure that it is important in this UNESCO city of literature we recognise their achievements and show positive support for their work. The Coroner's Daughter is a fascinating Gothic thriller which has lent itself well to this year's programme, promoting reading, but also promoting the city. And I am particularly pleased to see parts of Dublin's north inner city reflected in the novel. Lots of institutions have come on board to promote the book, not least Dublin City, the Hugh Lane Gallery, where we are this evening. And also the Royal Irish Academy, the Goethe Institute, the National Library of Ireland, and indeed the National Botanic Gardens, to name but a few and I'd like to acknowledge their involvement and that of all libraries across the city and the county of Dublin. It is a book that has many transits to it, crime, forensic science, the role of women in early 19th century Dublin, the religion, well-researched but keeping the focus on good storytelling. 
It's so well researched that I've been told a few experts have been looking out for discrepancies and are shocked not to find some. Um, so take a bow, Andrew. <laughs> Finally, if you haven't started to read this compelling novel, I suggest you get cracking now. And I'd like to invite the Minister, Catherine Martin, to say a few words now. Thank you. One Dublin, One Book. 2023. I, I am delighted to, to be here this evening at the 2023 One Dublin One Book event celebrating A Coroner's Daughter by Andrew Hughes. And thank you to the Lord Mayor and my um, good party colleague Caroline Conroy for the lovely welcome and launch to, to the event. Reading is so much more than just a pastime. It is a fundamental tool for learning for exploring new ideas, and for understanding ourselves and the world around us. It is also a way to connect with others, to share experiences, and to build a sense of community. And that is why events like tonight are so important. They are a chance to showcase and to celebrate the incredible talent of Irish writers like Andrew Hughes, from whom we are all looking forward to hearing from in a few minutes. The Coroner's Daughter is a masterful blend of historical fiction and mystery that give readers a sense of life in their city during the 19th century. With its richly drawn characters, intricate plot and atmospheric setting, Andrew has crafted a compelling story that keeps the reader guessing right up until the very end. Events like tonight also provide an opportunity for us to promote reading and literacy within the city. By bringing people together from all walks of life, we can help to foster a culture of reading that will benefit us all. It is therefore always a privilege to support Dublin UNESCO City of Literature and the great work being carried out by all involved. One Dublin, One Book has grown to be a popular event in the cultural calendar where it has had positive effects on promoting the pleasure of reading as well as on strengthening community links in Dublin. This award-winning campaign is coordinated annually by Dublin City Council's libraries and has long been supported by my department. The strong programme of free events organised across the city over the years has helped to expose people to Irish authors and draw them into their books. I understand that the positive response to the campaign this year may mean that we will see more of Abigail Lawless. And I think that that is a big endorsement for the DCC libraries and the impact that reading campaigns such as this one can have for readers and authors alike. The role of women in Irish society is a thread that runs throughout the coroner's daughter, with Abigail embodying the strength, intelligence and resilience of women who sought to make their voices heard in a society that often overlooked their contributions. I am glad that over recent years, efforts have been made to ensure that the books chosen for One Dublin, One Book have recognised the contributions of women to the great canon of Irish writers, beginning with Fallen by Leah Mills in 2016, and more recently Tatty by Christine Dwyer Hickey in 2020, and Nora by Nuala O'Connor last year. These books are part of an excellent collection of literary works that have been chosen for a Dublin-wide reading campaign, beginning in 2006 with Flan O'Brien's At Swim Two Birds, and which has included stories and poetry like Roddy Doyle's Barrytown Trilogy, Edna O'Brien's Country Girls, and If You Ever Go, edited by Pat Bourne and Jared Smith. I am delighted that Andrew now joins these ranks with the coroner's daughter. With our rich literary heritage and our vibrant contemporary writing scene, it is clear to see why Dublin is a UNESCO city of literature. And my department is an enthusiastic 
supporter of all work to encourage engagement with the flourishing literary arts in Dublin. Since 2010, Dublin has been a member of the Creative Cities Network in the world and with 42 other cities, belongs to the cluster of cities of literature. Led by Dublin City Council's library service and a network group representative of local and national interests, including representatives from my own department, the process of achieving international recognition as UNESCO City of Literature has brought together a broad variety of groups and organisations with the common purpose of enhancing Dublin's reputation as a preeminent city of literary and cultural diversity. On behalf of my department, I wish the programme continued success and congratulate Andrew for giving us the pleasure of this thrilling read, The Coroner's Daughter. Curran imokthi marsha an is da gahar kun kin go hochul, go na shuntha, agus go hither na shuntha, mar kahar litriakta. Kahar in a will on lehorakt, on skriv norakt, agus an skeliakt, fitche fuche. A sail cultura so shielta agus acnemiox sirani agus culturi nakaruk. When tahnif as an ia specialta sha, let's get Dublin reading. Great money, Margaret.
Good evening, readers. August Faltor of Galair. We are off to a very heartening and elegant beginning. Thank you, Lord Mayor and Minister, for those heartening words. And we've just heard Meditation from Thais by Massenet, played by the Dublin String Quartet. Aoife and Katie on violin, Paula on cello, and Shuan on viola. From their days busking together on Grafton Street during their school holidays in the 1990s to performing at Glastonbury, Electric Picnic, Body and Soul, Aoife, Katie, Shuan and Paula, the Dublin String Quart Quartet, individually and collectively, have performed with artists such as Codeline, Michael Buble, Julie Feeney and Sinead O'Connor. And later in the evening, we're going to enjoy two more pieces. This special One Dublin, One Book event celebrates Andrew Hughes's compellingly readable and hugely enjoyable novel, The Coroner's Daughter. Many of us here this evening have already read the book. Those of you who haven't, you're in for a real treat. Set in Dublin and Wicklow during the wet and incredible, miserable so-called summer of 1816, the coroner's daughter is not only brilliantly plotted, but as well as a dramatic storyline, Andrew Hughes offers us a vividly atmospheric recreation of social life in Dublin in the early 19th century. The novel also offers fascinating insights into medical and scientific practice and religious observance. Rutland Square, now Parnell Square just outside, is the main setting but we travelled to Clontarf, to Fitzwilliam Square, St George's Church, an art gallery on Hawken Street, the Royal Academy on Grafton Street, an observatory near Sagart, and there's a very thrilling and dramatic scene on a road in County Wicklow. There are six deaths, and at the heart of the novel is the coroner's daughter, 18-year-old Abigail Lawless. Andrew Hughes has Abigail tell the story and she tells it brilliantly. This evening's beautiful venue is particularly relevant in that a scene from the coroner's daughter is set here upstairs. And what is now Parnell Square was in 1816 Rutland Square, which is where Mr. Lawless and his daughter live at number four. Across the square, beyond the Rutland Pleasure Gardens, is the Nesham family home, number 44. And I just noted this evening on my way here, it is now the Sinn Féin headquarters. <laughs> and that also features in the novel, not, not the Sinn Féin, the, the <laughs> number 44. In fact, in the opening pages, the first of many murders, that of a newborn baby, takes place there. To begin, Andrew will talk about his life as an archivist and novelist, and the conversation will include two excerpts from the novel performed by actors Julie Crow and Shane O'Regan. So on behalf of everyone here, it's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Hughes. It could be argued, Andrew, that News from the past is always current. We live against a backdrop of what has gone before. Do you live more in the past or in the present in your life as you grew up in Enniscorthy, when you became an archivist and now an historical novelist? I think, uh, yeah, I, I definitely came to writing historical fiction from the history side. Uh, I studied history and English in Trinity College. After that, moved into the archives course in UCD and after that, I've just been immersed in archives in my working life. I started in the RTE archives, which is more modern, more visual, um, which perhaps has you know, influenced the kind of visual style of my writing. But otherwise, the work that I've done has always involved uh, original papers. And I think just that immersion has just given me this sense of having one foot in the past at all times, or at least having a connection with people in the past which I think um, studying archives and uh, reading archives just can give a person. And so when it came to writing historical fiction, or when it came to writing it fiction, first of all, it was a case of uh, would I try my hand at modern, 
style, modern crime, uh, but historical fiction just, just drew me in. But when you came upon the story of John Delahunt and 10,000 turned up to see him hanged when he was hanged in the 1840s in Dublin, um, was that the prompt for this novel, the character of John Delahunt, or were there other factors? No, absolutely. So yeah, my first book was a social history of Fitzwilliam Square. It was called Lives Less Ordinary. And uh, it came from these uh, house histories that I would do. So I was doing archives work, but I would also offer this service where, where I would research the history of Georgian houses. And I gathered together all 69 houses of Fitzwilliam Square and produced that book. But in number five, Fitzwilliam Square, which features in The Coroner's Daughter, again, just because of that, uh, there lived a man called uh, Edward Pennyfather, who was Lord Chief Justice of the King's Bench. He presided over the trial of Daniel O'Connell in 1844. When O'Connell was found guilty, he turned to, turned to one of his co-defendants and said, that jury would have convicted us of the murder of the Italian boy. So I was just looking at this court report because I was looking at number five at Swilling Square. I was just fascinated by this crime that O'Connell could just casually allude to, this murder of the Italian boy. I had never heard about it before. And when I went searching for reports about that case, I came across the name John Delahunt. So the Italian boy and the... Um John Delahunt are real figures. What about Mrs. Sarah Blackwood? I think she was invented, and it was a device for me, because uh, uh, Convictions of John Delahunt was told from Delahunt's point of view, he's writing his confession in, his, in the condemned cell of, of uh, Kilmainham Jail, uh, days before his execution. Obviously, I couldn't show him being executed because it's a first-person narrative. So it was a trick for me to show Delhunt's execution by having him, early in the novel, attend another execution. Down in Thomas Street. Yes. Where people rented out rooms and they sat at windows to watch the hanging of Sarah Blackwood and they smoked cigars and drank a glass of wine. Absolutely. And that's something I got from, um, you, might, you might vaguely remember it from your, from your history books in school. The execution of Robert Emmett in 1803 took place there in front of the... Uh, facade of St. Catherine's Church, and in that picture, when Emmett, I believe, has been uh, beheaded, you can see in the windows above the street people overlooking glasses of wine and so forth. So I, I think I invented Sarah Blackwood. It's possible that she came from something. It's long, long ago enough now that I can't quite remember, but I put, I, I merged that with the execution of Robert Emmett. I had Delahunt go along with his new girlfriend, Helen, just, and, and then I, it, I described Blackwood's execution in the, exact same, in the exact way that Delahunt died. But do tell us how she was found out. It's brilliant. Well, <laughs> I believe she was accused of murdering her husband, which you know, happens every now and again. And she had been uh, increasing doses of arsenic into his dinner. She had a young French lover, by oh, the way. <laughs> that might make a difference. And um, so bit by bit, she was increasing the dosage of arsenic in this poor man's dinner. And he just was kind of getting sicker and sicker, couldn't understand what was going on. One, it's not a very pleasant story. One evening, uh, he feels particularly sick, stumbles out into the yard. Uh, his dinner uh, re reappears. Uh, one of the family pigs then comes over, slurps up the spillings. When the pig keels over, <laughs> poison is suspected and uh, her, her bedroom is searched, the arsenic is found, a note from her French lover, and uh, she was sent off to the gallows. Right, we will move on to the coroner's daughter. <laughs> but, I mean, this book is so good, do not miss it. And um, if you think of John Delahunt himself, he's writing his, the story of how he came to be in prison before he was hanged in Kilmainham Jail. But he is, he gives Iago a good run for his money. He is amoral, he, is, he betrays everyone, he is shockingly awful, as I, but rivetingly interesting, but he's a nasty piece of work. Absolutely. But I mean, uh, like, that was directly then, uh, Abigail was a response to that. I had been in John Delahunt's head for so long and inhabiting this, amor this exactly this character that you described, and it, ca it could be fun, you know, just, be, you know, any situation that I placed him in, I just said, what's the most cynical, mean-spirited thing that he can do? I said, I'll just have him do that. But after a while, it, it, there was dark elements as well, obviously, with the, the crimes that he was committing. And so when it came to writing uh, my next novel, it was a case of, I want to just a complete change of pace. I want the main character to be the hero. Again, as a change of pace, I wanted her to be a young woman. 
and since uh, she would be in the 19th century, uh, the, only, the only way I could think of her having plausible access to cases of murder was to have her be the coroner's mm. daughter. So that character just kind of sprung into my head. Because I, I remember actually when it happened because uh, I had joined a, a writer's group, a historical fiction workshop, just down the road in the Irish Writers' Centre, writing Delahunt. We continued meeting then in the Gresham. And I remember walking home from the Gresham up towards Drumcondra and passing through Parnell Square. Mm -hmm. And just this idea for Abigail just popped into my head fully formed. And I was looking around and I could see the rotunda and I could see Charlemont House where we are. And I could see uh, uh, just the, the, the Georgian houses of then Rutland Square, now Parnell Square. I said, sure, I'll just place it here. Place it here. Now you must have done acres of research, but you carry it so lightly and so well. But do you know when you begin a novel, the direction it's going to go? Um, only very vaguely. I mean, uh, the joy of writing Delahunt was it was a true life uh, murderer. So his story was there set out for me. Mm. The crimes that he was committing were very much kind of staging posts for me in the narrative. I'd say, well, I just have to get to this. That's a third of the way through the novel. This crime is going to happen and then certain things happen. So from that point of view, that story was laid out for me. It was just a case of me finding my way. With Abigail, the first scene of the book is that murder of the newborn child that you mentioned. That came out of a true life. That was based on a true life case, a coroner's inquest that I found from an 1840s journal. Described this very um, uh, happening, uh, a household run by Mr. Nesham. Mr. Nesham was the master of the house. A young nursemaid conceals her pregnancy, murders her newborn, and even the hydrostatic test that was carried out came from this real life case, the hydrostatic test whereby the lungs of the newborn baby were submerged in water to see if they would float. If they floated, it meant that the lungs had been aerated, which meant that the baby had taken a breath, and therefore it was a case of willful murder rather than a stillbirth. And so all this was just laid out in this true life uh, case. And I was looking at coroner's inquests, looking for inspiration to, to, for Abigail to get the story going. I said, why don't I just show her and her father dealing with this very case. I used the name, changed other details. And so I just had that first scene. And then it was just a case of finding my way from there. Now, you must enjoy your brilliance at detail. I mean, in Abigail's bedroom, she has two pinups. One is Jenner, the man who invented the vaccine, and the other is Hunter, another scientist. The horses that draw her carriage are called Newton and Boyle, and the cat is called Kepler. So she's totally immersed in the scientific world, even though Papa sends her off to piano lessons yeah. and she's little interest in them. Yes, but I mean, he is definitely more indulgent than most, I'd say, would be for, uh, for his daughter to have interests like this. The fact that she's an only child and because of uh, the situation with her mother and so on, I think it became this kind of very isolated, insulated, but very cozy household that they had together, uh, and with um, the housekeeper, Mrs. Perrin, and so there's the upstairs, downstairs element of what goes on in a the house. They, they became like this family unit, so um, they were just drawn to each other and protected each other, and so Mr. Lawless definitely is indulgent of her more macabre interests. And she's very proactive. I mean, she rips a page from a Bible. Yes. She goes places where she should not go, and... Um, it rains a lot in this novel. The summer of 1816 was a non-summer, but you use weather brilliantly because at one stage there's a scene in a church, there's thunder and lightning, a maid takes a child out because the child is frightened and crying, and Abigail pretends she needs some air, and she goes out and quizzes the maid, or when it rains on top of her, in her carriage, she finds Gould in the street and she insists he join her and she's more, more sleuthing and detecting. Yeah. So the weather is as important as any character in the book. Yes, I mean, that, I mean it was really the first thing I thought about when, setting, or when to set the book and, and find my way into the book was this year without a summer of 1816, which happened because uh, Mount Tambora in Indonesia erupted in 1815. It was, perhaps the, uh, the, the largest uh, volcanic eruption in recorded history. And it sent this dust cloud over Western Europe and North America. It kind of uh, dimmed the sun, made it uh, look blood red. And I was just looking at that going, this is the perfect eerie setting for Gothic fiction. And so that was, the, that, that was my way into the novel initially. I remember the first line that I wrote was actually just about the weather. It was kind of a play on Orwell's, uh, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks had just struck 13. 
I said it was a hazy afternoon in early July and the frost had just begun to thaw. So it was my way in. But then I read that uh, Elmer Leonard's 10 rules of writing, the first one is don't begin with the weather. <laughs> so I had to jettison that. Well, but, <laughs> look at Jane Eyre. There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. And she got on with it. Absolutely, it can work. Uh, but that, so that weather was my way into the novel. And, uh, and we, were, we had a, a, this um, event in the National Botanic Gardens uh, with Joanna Donnelly, meteorologist. As you just mentioned there, the amount of books where weather plays a role mm. and it can work as atmosphere, it can work as symbolism, and it can just be plot points. Well, it's crucial in Wuthering Heights because Lockwood wouldn't end up there only for the weather. Yeah. He, couldn't, he couldn't get back to Thrushcross Grange. Absolutely. Um, the people within number four, Rutland Square, they read the Morning Post, the Freeman's Journal, and the Dublin Gazette, but for different people within the house. I presume you've read all of those papers and gleaned interesting details. It's, yeah, it's more a case of just having that resource there and it's it's available and it's so accessible now i mean this really comes out of the house history research that i do first and foremost when i research a history like that you find the names of people who live in a house through registry of deeds and street directories and so on but just by searching the address in these newspaper archives and if a story involved a person or a party was being held there or they were involved in some trial or whatever their names would come up. It was a way of me finding these names. And just by doing that research, I was constantly checking these particular newspapers. Not, I, I wasn't looking at them in particular. It's just because I search for a particular address, search for a name, these stories come up. And I think I just had looked at so many and was immersed in them that you just kind of, you pick up an ear for the language and it turns a phrase. Writers are like magpies. They just pick things that they like the sound of. And... Did you lose any sleepless nights over anachronisms? Uh, that's really where the research comes in, and there's a kind of a constant battle uh, as you're writing historical fiction that perhaps modern crime writers, well, perhaps modern crime writers have to deal with because of forensics and science and so on. Historical fiction writers are constantly just double checking the things that they're putting in the scene and how, how things work. So uh, I'm scared of anachronisms, and when they're pointed out, a piece of my heart breaks. I believe you have one. Oh, the only one I. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was a setup. I know it's a setup. Be, being a UCC man, I knew that UCC had not been founded in 1845 or whatever. It was much earlier, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but look, Shakespeare put clocks into Julius Caesar, and there were no yeah. clocks in ancient Rome. Yes. So it's a minor, minor quibble. Yeah, one that I found that was pointed out to me was was that letterboxes didn't exist in 1816, and I have letterboxes rattling all the time. And my first. <laughs> My first reaction is, who's going to know that? Who, who are these letterbox boffins? Nobody wants to be involved. But when I see them now in the book, I cringe a little bit and go, ah, oh, if only I'd known. OK. Apart from Abigail, who is the most interesting character? I presume Abigail is your most interesting character. Absolutely. And who, who would be second? Well, I, 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 presume, I, I suppose it's her father. Uh, and um, just because of this uh, uh, competing, uh, you know, his, his, his love of Abigail and obviously his concern for her, his indulgence of her forensic and macabre interests, but he also does demonstrate the proper concern for her reputation. Sure. And, you know, he, he, when she's sneaking into the anatomical theatre to uh, witness him at work, when he comes out and confronts her about it, his first concern is, what if people saw you? You know, mm -hmm. what would that do for your, your prospects in life? Because he knows himself that the curtailment of her you know, prospects in life through just not being able to study, not being able to pursue a career in these things, uh, means that a young woman at the time just has to find a match and, and find a marriage. So he is concerned about that. But then very quickly in that carriage ride home, Abigail says, will you show me other poisons and tests to establish poisons? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes, I will. If it keeps you out of the anatomical theater, then yes. Yeah. One of the many impressive things about the novel is that you give a backstory to so many characters, Professor Reeves or Michael Lawless himself. We, the, the character is deepened as the narrative unfolds. And did you have that in from the get-go or did you go back and add layers of depth or I think, deepen the... Yeah, I think for main characters, that's always something that you would have in mind. And before you write them down, you have a very 
fairly deep sense of who they are, where they mm -hmm. come from, and, and what's motivating them. But it's something that I've always tried to do, even for minor characters, to make them vivid on the page and to mm -hmm. make them distinct. It's just a way to enrich the world in general, yeah. but it's also something I find that as you're going along, uh, it, sometimes it's helpful to have a minor character reappear for mm -hmm. some piece of expertise yeah. that they can give, or uh, just somebody to open the door, or somebody to present a bit of news. And if they've been well drawn at the beginning, you can pluck them back and put them back in the narrative later on. There's a very minor, minor character in this novel, and it's one of 13 men, of a 13 jury men. Um, Lawless wants 13 in case there's a split de de decision. So they're all given pencil and paper, and one chap sits down and he sees the nib on his pencil is a little damaged. So without the other fellow spotting it, he swaps pencils. That's the only thing we know about that man. But it's Chekhovian. It gives you an insight into the way that man's mind operates. Talk to me about religion and the brethren and their presence right throughout the book. Yes. I mean, that came, again, from my first book, Lives Less Ordinary, the Victorian Square book. Again, a true life... Uh, 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 institution, a, a group that was founded in Fitzwilliam Square uh, called the Plymouth Brethren. Now, they got the name because after their first meetings in Dublin, they moved to England. Their first meetings there took place in Plymouth, so afterwards they're called the Plymouth Brethren. They're still around in Northern Ireland and North America, and I occasionally get letters from uh, Plymouth Brethren members. They were founded in the 1820s, and I just plucked them out and placed them in 1816, and very loosely based my brethren mm -hmm. on this Plymouth Brethren. They were also led by a charismatic, magnetic figure called Mr. Darby. He happened to be the spiritual advisor of that man, Edward Pennyfather, who I met. So he's there. real, Mr. Darby. Mr. Darby's real. But based on, inspired by this true life, Mr. Darby. I mean, there's a, an edition of the Bible. I don't know if you call it an edition. So, you know, one, a Bible, the, the Darby edition of the Bible, is based on this man's translation of the ancient text. Um, so they just struck me as the perfect kind of natural antagonists for uh, Abigail, you know, uh, spiky, pushing against the constraints of her age. Um, and uh, at the same time, there was this burgeoning uh, enlightenment going on, or, you know, students of the enlightenment in Dublin wanting to apply rationalist beliefs and scientific methods to, for instance, this strange weather and climatic mm -hmm. event that they were all going through. So it, it was this, the, the weather itself prevented, uh, presented this nice tinderbox atmosphere. You had the brethren, conservative, austere, students of the Enlightenment. Obviously, Abigail is going to be drawn towards the latter. And, but uh, the brethren, they don't bring much happiness with them, and it leads to terrible tragedies for some people within the world of the book. Yes. And it's, it's something you mentioned earlier about just history repeating and cycl cyclical things. Mm. And we're always just faced with these kind of reactionary conservative movements that spring up and die down and mm. come back. So they, they represent that. And so, yes, I mean, not, not to kind of give things away that are they as bad as perhaps they seem, but um, just by their very nature, they uh, cause havoc. And it is that that really, that Abigail just cannot stand. And by just seeing these things happen and... And, and Reeves' fears is going to go back to the Dark Ages, that Dublin will return to the Dark Age. Yes. Reeves, as a student of the Enlightenment, once sees kind of the Enlightenment kind of glowing all over Europe, mm. and sees this possibility of what was, what was actually called the Second Reformation, the, this kind of uh, evangelical awakening in Ireland in the early decades mm. of the 20th century was later called the Second Reformation. So Reeves sees this happening and does all that he can to uh, discredit. Catholicism so. doesn't get much of a look in, but it's kind of dismissed as superstitious and... Yes. I think that's just because of the, uh, the cast of characters that I had and where they were living. They just tended to be uh, members of the Anglo-Irish mm. ascendancy. Um, it's, it's just something that you know, I was conscious of as well. When writing historical fiction, we tend to be drawn to the stories of the more privileged. And mm. simply it's because, well, not simply, but one reason is because those are the stories that were written down, the privileged classes. Uh, recorded their history, whether through memoirs or letters and so on. And so those are the stories that have ended up in the archives that I've been dealing with. 
And, and when I research these house histories, those are the stories that I've come across. Mm -hmm. So they very much have, you know, the fiction that I've been writing is very much drawn to that Anglo-Irish ascendancy. You handle the love interest really well. It's very tentative. It just comes and goes, and it's, there is a thread in a way. It's not Bridgerton. Pardon? It's not oh, Bridgerton. it's not, no, it's not. <laughs> no, they keep their clothes on. But, um, but Andrew, um, was that there as well from the get-go? I mean, we're going to hear Julie and Shane in a moment read the opening few pages of the novel. And we have Michael Lawless, we have Abigail Lawless, and we've got Ewan Weir from the Scottish Lowlands. And he comes to uh, Dublin to study medicine at Trinity, but he obviously works as well with the coroner. Was he there from the beginning with that purpose in mind, that there, it might lead to something? Absolutely. I think, you know, just to give... You know, you have to have a love interest bubbling along, but he also just represented an ally, first and foremost, for Abigail. An opportunity, because really at this time, a young woman couldn't just walk around the city unchaperoned. So as you say... Oh, she does. She does, she certainly does. And that was more a case of the plot has to happen. I can't, couldn't constantly be having her sneak away from a chaperone and come back. But then Ewan does stand in. You know, he comes to find her at one stage when she sneaks into the rotunda. He's there for her, her in other ways when uh, she's injured, uh, fleeing from the man with the lazy eye and so on. So he was there as an ally. He was there as someone Abigail could kind of bounce ideas off or discuss other plot points. And obviously he's there as love interest. And the tension keeps bubbling along. It's time for Julie and Shane to bring this wonderful book to life. So um, we'll hear Julie and Shane now, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> we called it Father's Little Charnel House, but from the outside it looked quite cheery, almost a house in its own right, with grey slates and red bricks and ivy crowding the sash windows. The stables took up the ground floor. Newton and Boyle lifted their heads above the half doors as I passed by the carriage and cadaver cart. The rooms upstairs had once been home for the coachman and his family. And even now, whenever a new case arrived, Father liked to direct the pallbearers up to the living quarters. Its front office was sparse, just a few desks and shuttered cabinets, and a long work table in the middle of the room. Ewan was there, seated in the corner and writing in a ledger, his pen stilled. We both waited for the other to speak, then began to greet each other at once, then stopped and fell silent. I said, I was just looking... He's in the dissecting room. Oh, the only room I wasn't allowed in. Ewan noticed the letter in my hand. But I can deliver that to him if you wish. Do you mind if I wait instead? No, not He said. He seemed ready to find me a chair, but I hoisted myself up to sit on the edge of the examination table. Ewan cast his eyes over the work surface before returning his attention to the ledger. Father emerged from the dissecting room, bearing a tray covered in white cloth. He smiled when he saw me, pushed the door closed with his heel, and placed the tray on a side table. I slipped from the bench and held my letter out. Can you sign this? What is it? A letter to the editor of the Royal Society. Your observations on the sunspots. Among other things. Once the glasses were perched on his nose, he took the page and held it close to his face. Abigail, did I not forbid you from writing to the Royal Society? His lower lip protruded as he tilted the page towards the light. After the last time? No. You only forbade me from forging your name. Oh, yes. That was it. I went to the table where the covered tray had been set down. Ewan stood next to it, filling a glass bowl with water from a pewter jug. I said, what's this? I'm not sure I should. A very sad case came in yesterday. Father spoke while continuing to read. The corners of his mouth downturned. He frowned at the letter. Are you sure this figure is correct? I checked it twice. May I take a look? 
You and grip the side of the tray between his thumb and forefinger. Uh, really, I'm not at all. You may. The edge of the cloth was thick because of the double fold of the hem. I waited for Ewan to remove his hand and then drew the fabric aside. Two small organs sat in the middle of the tray, lying perpendicular to one another. They were squat, with a slight tapering, appeared dry to the touch, and were coloured a strange blend of pallid brown and green, with tinges of green and blue. Lungs, I said. The lungs of an infant. Father dipped a pen in ink and signed his name to the letter. A newborn boy. Brought from the rotunda? No. There was an incident in the home of Mr. Nesham in number 44. I knew of the man. A middle-aged barrister who lived across the square with his young wife and toddler daughter. The family would take strolls together in the sheltered paths of Rutland Gardens. The girls swaddled against the unseasonable cold. I looked down at the tray. Was this his son? Oh, no, no. Father paused and pursed his lips. Well, I presume not. He said that the child belonged to a young servant, first employed by the Neshams as a nursemaid. In the past few weeks, Mr. Nesham came to suspect that the maid was in the family way, though the girl denied it. On Sunday, she took to her bed complaining of sickness with symptoms so severe that a doctor was called, and he found that she had given birth within the previous 24 hours. Father placed his pen, nib first, in its upright holder. The girl said the child fell from her early in the morning while she happened to be out of bed. He was already dead, or died when he struck the ground, and she was so distraught and felt so forlorn that she bundled him up and dropped him in the Blessington Street Basin. The basin was a city reservoir not far from here. Father paused in his account and came to the table. Mr Weir, put some more water in that beaker, up to the gallon. Ewan poured until the level reached a small marker etched in the glass. Did they find the child in the reservoir? I said. No, there's more to it. He straightened his shoulders and cleared his throat. <clears throat> but first, you may have noticed, Mr. Weir, that the lungs are not displayed in their true position. They are back to front and top to bottom. So, he said, raising an index finger, how can we tell the left from the right? Ewan blinked twice and bent lower to peer at the tray. Yes, he said quietly. The way to distinguish the lungs. He folded his arms across his chest. The distinct features of the left and right. I began tapping my thumb against the corner of the table. Where did they find the baby, if not the reservoir? Come now, Ewan, said Father, eager for his pupil to get the answer. We went over this just a few weeks ago. After more of his humming, I pointed into the tray. That one was on the left. It contains the cardiac notch and has no middle lobe. Abigail, that question was from Mr. Weir. But I want to hear the rest of the Nesham story. <sighs> yes. Well, before he asked the authorities to trawl the city basin, Mr. Nesham decided it best to search the maid's room. The child was discovered wrapped in a rug and concealed beneath the bed. As Mr. Nesham unfolded the bundle, he said to the girl that he hoped she had done no violence to the child, and she replied, Oh, sir, you will soon see. He found the boy with his throat cut and a penknife lying on his breast. I glanced again at the two tiny lungs, stark against the metal tray. She murdered her own baby. That is the assumption, though the maid insists the child was dead born that she had taken the blade to cut the navel string, and at that moment, when she saw the consequences of her sin and shame, such was her state of mind that she did not know her actions. Ewan's face was solemn. That is hardly a credible claim. No, said my father, but since it could spare her being charged with murder, it is one that deserves to be tested. He drew the glass bowl towards him and placed an oil lamp beside it. The water was a bit cloudy, with tiny particles swirling this way and that, as if they'd been startled by the light. Father picked up each lung in turn and slipped them into the water, as Mrs. Perrin would drop fillets of meat into a pan. The organs drifted down. Tiny bubbles formed and clung to their sides. 
They slowed as they neared the bottom, bumped against the base of the bowl and each other before beginning to climb again. They rotated upwards, breached the water's surface and remained afloat, their tops bobbing and glistening in the lamplight. Ewan and I had leaned down to look closer so our heads almost touched. He said, The lungs are buoyant. What does that mean? The baby must have taken a breath. Father prodded once with submerged, and he watched it float to the surface again. I would say several. In fact, he may have cried for a few moments. I am surprised that it did not alert the household. There had been a hailstorm that night. I'd lain awake listening to the incessant tattoo. The strongest gusts had sounded like boots crunching through gravel. She did murder him. Abigail, what have I told you about jumping to conclusions? This only confirms that the child was murdered. He picked up a large perforated spoon, like those used to remove poached eggs, and the lungs drained as he fished them out. Though I admit she is by far the most likely culprit. And why would you doubt it? Father handed you in the spoon. Mr. Weir, will you return this to the kitchen, preferably without Mrs. Perrin seeing you? Then use the water on the orchids in the greenhouse. Uh, yes, sir. I promised Nesham that I'd visit him in his home this afternoon to tell him what I'd found, and then I have a lecture to give. Father began to look around his office while patting the sides of his pockets. Abigail, we also have an appointment in town, so you'd best come with me. I thought he'd forgotten. I'd hoped he'd forgotten. An afternoon undisturbed in the library had beckoned. Perhaps we should postpone that. Your meeting with Mr. Nesham is too important. We cannot. Mrs. Meekins is our only remaining option. And when we speak to her, you are not to question her methods. Even if they make no sense? Especially if they make no sense. Ewan had been watching our exchange, but when I glanced at him, he took up the spoon and withdrew. Father said, You know your mother wished for you to develop pastimes that were more... Typical for a young lady. But... So I want you to be good. My letter remained on his desk, and I gently brushed a finger over his signature. The ink didn't smudge, at least not very much, so I folded the paper and put it in my pocket and said, Yes, Father.
And that was the celebrated duet from the Pearl Fishers, Enfant du Temple Saint. The death of that little boy, the baby boy, Morgan Casey, at the beginning is the first of six deaths in the novel. Um, it is shocking and is terrible, and it's in a novel. But you also give us a fact, not about killing of babies, but we read in this novel that one in six babies would not live beyond 10 days, the babies born down in the rotunda. So life was very, very grim for the working classes, the lower classes. Yes, absolutely. Again, it's something, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you're telling these stories of Anglo-Irish, you're telling people of great privilege. So that, that fact came up when Abigail was looking out her bedroom, I believe, and are just kind of remembering the promenades that would take place in Rutland Gardens and, you know, an army band playing and ladies and gentlemen uh, linked arms and walking through. And Abigail, while looking at that scene, her eyes would be drawn to the windows. And she was just imagining the disparity between what was going on in those squalid wards and the, mm. the, the women of the city, the poorest women of the city, and uh, the terrible things that they were going through. And just this grand, carefree, privileged and wealthy people promenade, promenading uh, underneath them. And it's something that I was conscious of bringing up in the novel as much as I could, just the fact that there was this year without a summer and that crops had failed and that there was hardship. So at one point, when they're going out to Clontarf, they... They meet with the people who are upon, destitute. Yeah, yes, trying to uh, get, get food from a soup mm. kitchen. And there's this tense standoff where the poor crowd surround this carriage. And so Abigail, you know, who is the daughter of this privilege, is, comes mm. face to face with the fact that, you know, the people out there are much less privileged than she, and there is a danger there, the fact that once uh, people become mm -hmm. desperate enough, her life and her social sphere could collapse, could, you know, as, you know, revolution is going through Europe and so on, so. But the pleasure gardens were then denied the gentry. They paid five pence and the money went towards the lying in hospital. But we were told that the association for this, the discontinence this continencing of vice <laughs> put an end to it. Or, and it was 10p to go up um, Nelson's pillar. Yes. So, yeah, you, so you, as Abigail is going through the city, you just imagine, so these things are only just brand new. So they're, they're, they've only sure. just been built. And so she imagines, as an 11-year-old girl, being brought through Sackville Street, as it was then. And she just remembers mm. uh, Nelson being hoisted atop the pillar. And she can't help but imagine what oh. if he slipped and was dashed on the pavement below. But that came through because I... Uh, saw the spire being brought up in the same spot. And did you wish it to topple over? <laughs> <laughs> I remember somebody, uh, uh, as, as the workers were going up and everybody's looking at them going up to the top of this, you know, giant thing, and some Dublin wag just said, oh, I think he dropped a spanner. <laughs> <laughs> You've obviously walked the walk for this novel in the streets of Dublin. You know Dublin so well, so that when Devlin leaves 44, he goes up Dorset Street, down Cable Street, etc. But when you set the scene in this wonderful building, did you go upstairs and walk the rooms? No, I didn't. This was just a leap of imagination. Um, I, so I wanted this, this, this ball at Charlemont House to be kind of one of the focal points of the scene, right. or the novel. It's one of the only points where practically all the characters are on stage and various things could be uh, uh, progressed. But I based that on the Netherfield Ball of Pride and Prejudice. And there was this BBC series that came out in 2013, a kind of a recreation of the Netherfield Ball, which was just this wonderful source for me. You, you can kind of glean it from the pages of Pride and Prejudice. Okay. But to have the BBC uh, use actors such as Julian Shane uh, in full costume, uh, going through just what happened in a ball like this, what music was played, what were the, you know, what, which dances, happened before the supper, how did the supper work? Mm. So I could just recreate that ball using the rooms here. And so I didn't walk in just to check the rooms, that was more. And where did you come across the bourdaloo? The dance? No, no, the, the women wearing voluminous skirts. This oh. is a, sure. having a comfort stop. Oh, did I mention that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> That could well have come from that BBC documentary. Okay. Because that's not something that I have in the top of my head. So I must have found it somewhere. <laughs> and what about the mechanical doll, you know, made by Ellie and the horologist? It was that 
a, a, a real or was it something you just invented? No, that, that was real. There, there were these automatons. Just, it's incredible when you look at these feats of engineering from the 17th and 18th century, just the intricacy of these clockworks. And you just can't believe how were the tools even and the, and the skill set to produce something like that. And these clockmakers would produce automatons and there were names to them. I think there was one perhaps called the dancer and there was one, the writer, a little boy, uh, fully automated who would write script out on a page. And that was really just to bring Reeves into the novel or just this, as this, uh, this symbol of the enlightenment and progress. And the orrery in the observatory? Was that another thing you researched? Um, I, I presume I must have. I definitely did look into what was known in terms of astronomy at the time. And so Reeves is mm -hmm. an astronomer, and so they were looking for, uh, I believe they called it the Georgian planet, which we, we would now say Uranus. Yeah. And so uh, it was just a case of uh, what was known at the time and the fact that there was a perturbation in the orbit, which meant that there was a further planet beyond and it's just kind of a symbol of looking in the dark. You can, you can see uh, the influence of something by the fact that the orbit of the Georgian planet is perturbed. So what is causing that perturbation? So it's just a symbol of Abigail searching. Yeah. Talk to me about the scene at Manor Kilbride. It's terrific. Yeah, um, I think that was then I was fully into Gothic uh, fiction mode. It was a dark and stormy dark. night. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the first line, but it definitely, uh, it helps with the atmosphere. Um, yes, so uh, at one point, uh, Mr. Darby is uh, accused of murder at an inquest. Uh, he He's escapes, shot at. He is shot at and uh, escapes the a gunfire at the inquest, allows Mr. Darby to flee. Mm -hmm. And it's just a case of where he went to. And I think it was just, again, there's, there's elements when you're writing a book that you just need something that's convenient. So you search for a place that Abigail could plausibly get to in the amount of time required. Four hours. Yeah, four hours from stagecoach, taking off from Nelson Pillar. Um, so it's just, it's, it's convenient for the plot. It's in the right area of where I want to be. And then of course you just say, well, this is the Wicklow Hills on a, on a dark and stormy night. And so the atmosphere is there. And yeah, so uh, then it's just creating this, uh, uh, the house that, uh, Mr. Darby is staying at this kind of ruined vicarage that Abigail sneaks into and is searching for mm. him and discovers him there. And, and the buttercups, Abigail is, uh, she fears that she's about to die and she begins eating buttercups. Why? Well, there's a, there's a nice kind of uh, theme that's run through the buttercups, or uh, buttercups running through the book. We had an event in the National Library uh, only on Saturday which was with Marianne Lee, who wrote about Ireland's first uh, botanist, female mm. botanist, Ellen Hutchins. And somebody in the crowd then, because she, I think she was a botanist herself, pointed out this theme of buttercups that ran through the book. At the start, it was a way to show, again, Mr. Lawless's indulgence of her curiosity, because when she was a small girl, Abigail ate the petals of a buttercup and got sick because of the poisonous elements of it. And she said that is how uh, Mr. Lawless taught her the common poisons mm. of garden plants is going to come up in the second reading. And then I kept that theme of the buttercup running, running through. So one of Abigail's only memories of her mother is when her mother holds a buttercup beneath her chin and does the whole, I can see the reflection of the sun in your chin, that means you like butter. Uh, when she meets with Mrs. Longsworth. She and gives the little girl the a, a clip hair that clip. Has a buttercup in it. And this was all leading up to this, this thing that she mentioned that I wanted Abigail to leave a clue for her father. Defined to the end. Yes, that this wasn't an accident. Even though her antagonist was making it look like an accident, she said, I have to be able to show something to my father. I'll eat the petals of buttercup during autopsy. Even just that bizarre fact will throw suspicion on the whole thing. And that was then just calling back to the buttercups that had been placed throughout the book was to keep that in the reader's mind. Mm. Now, I believe you've written a third novel a crime novel, um, and is set in contemporary Dublin. Yes. So everyone has mobile phones. Absolutely. It's and a, is that a problem? It's, a, it's actually kind of a relief. Well, one of the reliefs was um, not uh, having to research every last uh, part of the book in terms of historical research. 
I've heard that mobile phones can cause terrible trouble for fiction writers, but I think there's opportunities as well in that in ease of communication and show people on social media and so on. So yes, I wrote a modern crime book. He is, uh, the main character is an archivist like me. Is it a first person narrator? First person narrator. Would you ever opt for the omniscient narrator? I have tried that and I tried it with Abigail in fact. At, at the start of the book she was, I was being told in the third person from her point of view, but I'm not sure, I just kind of feel a disconnect with the character when that happens, so I tend to write first person. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this book is just finished, uh, set in modern Dublin, uh, a man called Lister, he's an archivist. It's been described, not by me, but by my agent, so it might as well be me, as Tana French meets Sally Rooney. Okay. <laughs> I've described it as normal people with murders, so uh, hopefully, my, my agent's in London at the moment trying to get a deal, so hopefully that works out. Okay, so and have any of these books been optioned for the big screen or the small screen? Because, I mean, Joseph Conrad says of writing, above all to make you see. And when I read and reread both books, I could see things so vividly. I could see the hairline crack in the glasses belonging to the clerk. I could see little details everywhere. The taxidermied, the badly taxidermied dog in Whistler's workroom. I mean, um, I could just see things so vividly, so... Yeah, but I would absolutely love that. Uh, as I mentioned, so the London Book Fair is happening in London right now. I think it might have finished today. But my agent, Paul, is in London. Uh, he's pitching the, the modern novel that I've just written, and he's pitching uh, The Coroner's Daughter for TV rights, which would be absolutely fantastic. I did get encouraging news about the, my latest book, the modern novel. A producer there uh, absolutely loved it, and uh, he said he's taking it to the head of television. So I don't know if this is the head of television of all of Europe or something. <laughs> <laughs> the planet. Somebody, yeah, in some strange throne room of flat screen TVs will hopefully give the nod. But, it, uh, you know, touch wood, nothing, nothing is signed. And what have you called it? The, it's called Emma Disappeared. Emma Disappeared. There's a comma between Emma and Disappeared just to make it more ambiguous. <laughs> okay. Just okay. make it fancy and literary. No, that, that, that's intriguing enough. <laughs> and I've, I've, uh, because of this one Dublin boost, I've started writing an Abigail Lawless sequel, so there will oh, be a very good. daughter too that yeah. I'm currently writing. Do you ever worry about, I mean, in the John Delahunt uh, novel, the backstreet abortion and the death of Thomas Maguire was just gruesome. Gruesome. Brilliantly done, but upsetting and vivid. Um, do you ever worry about, you know, is it the sensitivity thing now? People are, you know, a, a person writes a book and they're asked, to, they're, they're given to readers for sensitivity issues, or someone is reading, or someone is now lecturing on persuasion by Jane Austen, and they have to apologize in advance in case someone is upset. I can't imagine what upset one might experience reading Persuasion, with this kind of trigger thing, you know, um, King Lear has eyes gouged out in the text, so perhaps we shouldn't be teaching that. Do you ever worry about your reader and... No, that's never something that's, that's uh, occurred to me. Uh, I just, you know, the, gruesome, the more gruesome the better. Uh, hopefully the readers can handle it. Um, it's something, it's strangely something that a kind of my own sensitivity came into play in that before I started working on Corner's Daughter, I, I, I began, very tentatively began, a novel about, a true, again, a true crime, a true life case in 1920s Ireland, the murder of Honor Bright, a Dublin prostitute who was found in the Dublin mountains. And just the fact that there was a 20th century thing, just the fact that there was a photograph of this poor woman uh, where she died in the Dublin mountains, just made it all much more uh, immediate, it made it much more visceral, and I myself found I, I had a sensitivity to, to telling that story, which is odd because I didn't feel that for these true life people who died in the 1840s. It's just that strange remove of time had made it uh, that I could handle writing those stories in the 1840s, but seeing the photograph of this dead woman meant that I just felt I couldn't tell her story. So it's a sensitivity of my own rather than mm. um, in a reader's. Um, John Banville writes his literature novels and they take six years. He rattles off his crime novels in three months. Yeah. Thank you, John. <laughs> but how long do you spend writing Emma, comma, disappeared? Well, how long's a piece of string? You know, let's, you know, it, uh, I, I t I'm a slow writer. Do you write by hand or keyboard? Keyboard. I, I, I started with this historical fiction workshop and we've continued to meet. 
So every Thursday, uh, our, our, our workshop meets, and so there's always something that I'm trying to uh, provide to that workshop. Okay. We, we read each other's work in progress and comment on it, so I'm constantly chipping away at these numbers. And what major change has that group brought about in your writing? Did they ever say, Andrew, this is not working, this is all wrong, go back, take that out? N no, no, they wouldn't say. <laughs> Something, no, no, it's, uh, it's very constructive. I mean, it's, it's a huge, uh, the change that it made to my writing, it's more the change that it made to my life, really. It, to, to, to find this, this group of people, just by chance, when I walked into the Irish Writers' Centre in 2011 or 2012, and found this group led by the brilliant John Givens, uh, it, it's provided this uh, a source of, you know, camaraderie. We're all in it together. We're all writing, you know, we're all in the same boat in, a, in what can be a kind of an isolated profession. And different historical periods. Different historical periods, but then we, it started out as a historical fiction workshop. We've branched out, and really, it's just a general fiction workshop now. Okay. So, like, even though my latest is a modern crime, it was still written within that workshop. And, I mean, John's insight is absolutely brilliant. The insight of our fellow uh, members is always great. And so it would never be as stark as that, but there would be constructive criticism, mm. of course. And is um, Emma, comma, disappeared? I love the title. Is it based in Dublin, Dublin, or do you go outside? Do you go to a manor Kilbride? No, it's very much based in Dublin. As I said, he's an archivist like me. He lives in Botanic Avenue like me. But there, you know, the similarities, especially when the murders start happening. No, I very much, uh, yeah, I, I, I just liked, uh, it was nice just to set in the city. I think maybe it's just, I'm so used now to writing in the city, and I could explore um, the kind of middle class life of, that we have now, of course. English underworld also plays a part. Now, when you're not writing, who are you reading? Uh, well, I read whatever comes along. One of the joys of One Dublin is to be able to read the, the novels of the various people that I've been on the panels with. I've written nothing, Andrew. You were spared. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, checked, I checked out your, uh, the poetry book that you had. Okay. So that's been, that's been one of the joys. And um, do you read Irish writers or, I mean, who, who would be your, you know, hero for the crime novel? I think maybe you mentioned Banville there. And I think when I'm going back to writing Delahunt, I was hugely inspired by Book of Evidence. It's that same kind of confessional idea, same kind of cynical character. So I think uh, Freddie Montgomery um, and the fact that it was based on a, roughly real, based on a yes. real life character, that was a huge influence when I was starting out. Okay, and um, we're looking at the clock, and we now have another excerpt, please, from Shane and Julie. And this scene is um, Ewan and um, Ms. Abigail Lawless testing each other in terms of forensic knowledge. He turned when he heard me and seemed ready to get up. I'm sorry, I thought everyone was asleep. Would you like to use the parlour? I waved for him to remain. Stay! I'll only be a minute. He nodded and resumed reading, leafing back a page as if he'd lost his place. I went to the bookcase and scanned its titles. There was the copy of Lewis's romantic tales that I had come to get, but I felt conscious now of picking it out. Ewan said, Has the noise of the thunder kept you from sleeping? Oh, no, I'm often awake at this hour. I'm the same. It's easier to study in the smaller hours. What are you reading? He turned the spine towards me. Very dull, I fear. I moved closer to see the gold leaf lettering of Mail's epitome of forensics. Your father likes to test me with hypothetical cases when we work, describing one or two, uh, two or three signs of death and asking me to deduce the cause. He pursed his lips and flicked through some pages of the tome. More often than not, I am stumped. What a good idea. I sat down on the couch, leaving a space between us, and held my hand out for the book. Let's see if you fare better now. He smiled at me, but then hesitated. Some of the descriptions are rather distressing. Why, I have read it twice before. Yes, of course, I keep forgetting. He passed me the book, and I leaned back to leaf through it. Now, don't give me one that's too obscure. How will you ever learn? I said reading over an entry in the section marked Aerial Poisons. I sat up straight and looked at him steadily. You are called to examine an unfortunate man 
who shows every appearance of strangulation, except there are no marks on his neck. His eyes are open and staring, tongue protruding, fists clenched, and jaw locked. You needn't see it so eagerly. <laughs> when you open him up, the ventricles of the brain contain a serum tinged with blood. The lungs are collapsed, and the viscera are dark coloured and turgid. I close the book in my lap. So, Mr. Weir, how do you think this poor man met his death? He held my eye for a moment, an amused slant to his brow, and then he spoke his thoughts aloud. Well, there are no wounds or contusions, and you would not have given me a case as dull as a fit of apoplexy. Something was ingested or inhaled. He drummed his fingers on the armrest. Do you give up? No, no. I just need more details. In what kind of a room was he found? It doesn't say. Well, imagine it. A garret. Above what? Uh, a business on the dockside. You and thought some more. If he lived above a trade, his room may have been gathering vapour from below, chemicals from a tanner perhaps, or carbonic gas from a lime kiln. Yes, I said, opening the book to show him the entry in the epitome. That's exactly it. Fumes from the burning of lime. Our shoulders drew close as he leaned over to see. Really? In truth, it was a guess. He asked if he could have the book back. What for? Because it's your turn. No, I have not read mail for several months. Oh, don't make excuses. Like me, he flicked through the pages to pick out a case, glancing at me suspiciously once or twice as if I might spy the chapter. When ready, he told a tale of three sisters at a masquerade, chatting by the punch bowl. As the night wore on, one was seen to be flighty and unsteady in her dancing. Another retired early, feeling unwell. And at midnight, when everyone was unmasked, the third was found dead in her seat, her young, fair face contorted in seizure. During autopsy, you find no other symptom of, or sign of death. But there must be. I'm afraid not. He was pleased with himself. Outside, a gust made the window shutters creak, and the clock on the mantel continued to tick. I tried to recall some of the more exotic poisons and their symptoms, but I could think of none that would affect three people so differently. Ewan was humming a strain from a Scottish folk song, and I told him to hush. Years ago, when I ate the petals of a buttercup, Father had shown me all the flowers in the park that were toxic. Wolfsbane and nightshade and laurel. He said that one of the most common of all presented the greatest danger. Its odour caused giddiness and headache, while those who consumed it suffered convulsions and death. It was all I could think of, so I said, the punch was laced with water hemlock. Ewan let out an exasperated sigh and opened the book again. Am I correct? That was far too easy. Yeah. I'll have to give you another. Oh no. I reached over to grip the top of the book. The next question is for you. I knew I should have asked you the one about the copper sulfate. I shifted closer to take the book back, but he kept his hold. And we were smiling together at our small tug of war when a voice by the door said, Miss Abigail. What on earth are you doing up at this hour? Mrs. Perrin stood by the threshold, a small conical flame snuffer in her hand. The physical intimacy between Ewan and Abigail is very gentle and very subtle. I look forward to the raucous normal people <laughs> intimacy of Emma, comma, disappeared. <laughs> Halfway through the coroner's daughter, there's a moment when Michael Lawless comes across Abigail in the library. What are you reading, he asks, and she replies, just a novel. Andrew Hughes is having fun here, 
And it reminded me of that moment in Jane Austen's North Anger Abbey, when a character is asked what she is reading, and she replies, oh, it is only a novel. And Jane Austen adds, or in short, only some work in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineations of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humour are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. And that's what Andrew Hughes has given us in The Coroner's Daughter, an insightful, intelligent, lively, serious, entertaining and witty work in the best chosen language. And to conclude, the Dublin String Quartet, and this will be followed by a drinks reception. Thank you all for being here. Thank you especially to Anne-Marie Kelly of the UNESCO City of Literature and her team. Thank you to Julianne mooney Siren. Thank you to Minister Catherine Ryan and the Lord Mayor. And also thank you to the Dublin String Quartet and the sound people and the film people. And the Dublin String Quartet will now play the double concerto in D minor second movement by Johann Sebastian Bach.